අලුතෙන් SLT Mobitel Home 4G LTE connection ගන්න අයට වටිනා ටැබ් computer සහ data දීමන. අලුතෙන් SLT Mobitel Home 4G LTE connection ගන්න අයට වටිනා ටැබ් computer සහ data දීමන. මුළු රටටම සැඟ වුණු අවුරුදු උකුරහස. Tonight, not for me. Sri Lanka's new finance minister Ali Sabri resigns after one day on the job as Treasury Secretary Artikala follows suit. New faces. The International Monetary Fund says it's watching Sri Lanka closely as a new central bank governor is named. Constitutional propriety. Opposition leader Sajid Premadasa calls for the government to resign as the leader of the House says parliament can't do the impossible. Watch your backs. Public protests continue for the sixth day straight as the Bar Association and the police urge protesters to be wary of saboteurs. All this and much more coming up tonight on First at Nine, this Tuesday, the 5th of April 2022. Introducing New Hellman's, the world's number one mayonnaise brand now in Sri Lanka. From Adha Derana, this is Adha Derana First at Nine. From Studio 24 in Colombo. Bringing you the latest from across the island, this is First at Nine, and I'm David Ebert. Now, the ruling Sri Lanka Podujana Perumuna lost its two thirds majority in parliament today after a total of 42 parliamentarians decided to remain as independent MPs within the House. Even though the 42 parliamentarians have stepped away from the government ranks, the SLPP, however, continues to possess a simple majority right now with a five-seat lead. Protests continue to take place across the country with people demanding for solutions for the current economic crisis and for the current political authority to step down. In this backdrop, the country's cabinet of ministers tendered their resignations while a few state ministers also stepped down from their portfolios. Meanwhile, in parliament today, a total of 42 parliamentarians representing the Sri Lanka Pudujana Perumuna, the Sri Lanka Freedom Party, the Ceylon Workers' Congress, and the Ceylon Makkal Congress announced that they would continue as independent members. As such, MPs Anura Priya Darshana Yapa, John Seniviratnam, Dr. Susil Premajayanta, Chandima Veera Kodi, Nalin Fernando, Nimal Lanza, Dr. Sudarshini Fernando Pulle, Priyankara Jayaratnam, and Jayaratna Herat of the current government had decided to act independently. Further, MPs Vimal Veera Vansa, Udaya Gamman Pilla, Vasudeva Nana Akara, Thisavitarana, Tira Nalas, Venerable Athuraliya Ratana Thera, Gevindu Kumara Tunga, Veera Sumana Veera Singha, Asanka Navaratna, Mohammed Musamil, Nimal Piyatissa, Gamini Velaboda, ALM Ataula, Jayanta Samaravira, and Uddika Premaratna, representing other 10 political parties, have decided to become independent. Meanwhile, 14 members of the Sri Lanka Freedom Party, including Chairman Maitri Palasirisena, had also decided to proceed independently in the parliament. The remaining 13 members of the SLFP include Nimal Siripala de Silva, Mahinda Maravira, Dayasiri Jayasekara, Duminda Disanayaka, Lasant Alagiyavanna, Ranjit Siamala Pitiya, Jagat Pushpakumara, Shan Vijay Lal de Silva, Shanta Bandara, Sarat Dushmanta, Dr. Surin Raghavan, Angajan Ramanathan, and Sampad Disanayaka. In addition, MP SMM Musharraf of All Ceylon Makkal Congress and two parliamentarians of the Ceylon Workers' Congress have also become independent members of the House. Due to this, the total number of members with the SLPP has reduced to 117, meaning the party has lost its two-thirds majority. However, the SLPP still has a simple majority in the parliament as it leads by five seats, exceeding the simple majority's requirement of 112 seats. Speaking during a media briefing today, former State Minister of Estate Housing and Community Infrastructure Jeevan Thondaman explained his party's reason to quit the government and the reason for his resignation as State Minister. As a party, a decision had been taken that we are withdrawing our support and that I will be resigning my minister post. We do not feel it is right. And more than that, 
As you can see right now in the roads all over the country, the youth are protesting and being a youth representative in parliament, I should set an example and I should lead by example. And with that being said, we did take a decision where even in times of difficulties or in times of adversity, we must make the right decision. And right now people have given their mandate and we have to wait and see as to what can be done. Political parties in parliament have offered various opinions on how sessions should be used today ranging from short-term financing to help the country manage its balance of payments, voting on the emergency declaration by President Gota Bay Rajapaksa and the public upheaval seen on the streets of Sri Lanka. Meanwhile, opposition leader Sajid Premadasa took the opportunity to call for the abolition of the executive presidency with immediate effect and urged the government to listen to the voice of the people and simply go home. However, leader of the House Dinesh Gunawadira responded, saying that constitutionally, the only way forward remains for all parties to unite and form a national government to seek out solutions. The Tamil National Alliance called today for a vote in the House tomorrow to approve or reject the declaration of the state of emergency by the President. Also speaking was the UNP leader Ranil Vikramasinghe, who called for the Finance Minister to listen to his advice on seeking short-term financing from the World Bank and the ADB. There is a notification table today on the proclamation of emergency. Under the constitution, this must be placed before parliament and approved or disapproved at the earliest possible opportunity. We heard President Maitripal Sirisena, honorable member of parliament, say that their party does not approve of the proclamation of emergency. I want to ask the government to place this tomorrow for parliament to decide whether parliament will approve of this or not because otherwise they are misusing the powers by allowing it to remain for 14 days and then lapse and anything done within those 14 days would be deemed legal. That's an abuse of the process, abuse of the provisions of the public security ordinance and abuse of the provisions of the constitutions. I am requesting that as the constitution has mandated even now, we can suspend the standing orders and place the proclamation of emergency for a vote in this parliament now. And what then? I am a Sangvidan at a Yanta, Tine Kalatine, a Teka Prasna Tino, Api Beluot, a Vartave, Ape Baladar in Kiano, Merate Artica Prasna, the view of the authorities, Mama Udalamutumatakian, Eka Ainkala, Atavasem, Me Vidaka Mandale, Vidaka Mandale, Yojana Anwa. साक्षात्कार करके नहीं आने अभी तो उदाहरण करने में में आए थे ना तामतर रापी उदाहरण करने इंडिया वो चीने जापाने दक्षिण कोरिया वो ये वाके में यूरोपीय संघ में सामग्र एक शांविदा एंड कंसोर्टियम वन कंसोर्टियम तू ऐसे 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 दिस कंट्री एंड फाइंड दैट मनी अंटिल द ये रातवालू लास्टी इन द मीन टाइम Opposition leader Sajid Premadasa in अदर मेरा टे विशाल जनकोट्टा से महापार्ट टे बहला किसी में बियक सके आप नहीं हुआ हादी सिनीति ये खड़ा करा ला कर्फ्यू खड़ा करा ला अदर मूल रटम है एक अमीटर टे एक अक्कीयन हुआ मुखातक ही अन्य मेक अपि मगे हरा ला बहे कीयन खत्म करे मुखात में अतुलत तेरे नो अदर गैस पॉली में विनिन दुख अम्मला दुआला डीजल पॉली में पेट्रोल पॉली में भूमि तेल पॉली में सीनी पॉली में हाल पॉली में महापौले वे क्रियात्मक में ना स्लोगन ने का मुखाद्दे जनता वकियान ने मुखाद्दे जनता वकियान ने में आंड वोट के दरे आंड किया ला एक आयत तक आता है एंड खाले एलमिलाती में ना विधा है का जनादिपति क्रम में वे नस्करण प्रजातंत्रवादी 
Aradhana Vakra, Munvaimat Amati Mandali Ajlasvi, Sielu Deshpalam Pakshavala Tavi Pakshe, Ekatu Vela, Me Pavatina, Jati Kavase and Matu Itibana Bharapatala Tatwe, the Visunu Mati, Kriya Margekata, Andwa Katikaran Nikatu in Nikila. Andukra Vatavati Bene Pamanai. And isa Nati Deva Yojana Karande Apita Pulwa. Bahutarayak Parliament to Tien Ape Andwata. Bahutarayak Parliament to Ape Andwata Natang, Obatumalata, Ea Idri Patkaran Pulwa. Eh, anu apa itu parlimen tu? Eko visu orang ini puluan. Mati orang ni kita kawan karan. Eh mana tang? Garu kata na, kita tu mangket. Awad ane yang mukaran ni. Raja hati hati. Obat tu malat hati. Bahu terayat ini, na anuak pihit orang ni. Jangan tu betul mangking. Itu dah nuan de puluan. Eh, kisi waktu tu orang ata. Desa pan ha, arti kwa hati bi itu bena arbu de hamuye. Thawa tu orang ata araji kata tu er daya kawan ni pa. Newly appointed Finance Minister Ali Sabri has resigned from his position. Having accepted the portfolio yesterday, the minister stayed on in the post long enough to present the International Monetary Fund's Article 4 consultation report on Sri Lanka in Parliament. He has also called for fresh and unorthodox steps to be taken to handle Sri Lanka's crisis. In the past 24 hours, Sri Lanka's cabinet underwent drastic changes when all its members tendered their resignations to Prime Minister Mahinda Rajapaksa. However, President Gotabe Rajapaksa appointed four ministers to maintain parliamentary affairs and other functions of the country until a full cabinet is appointed. Accordingly, Professor G. L. Piris was sworn in as foreign minister, President's Council Alisabri as a finance minister, Johnston Fernando as a minister of highways, and Dinesh Gunavardhana as the education minister. However, just more than a day after his appointment, Finance Minister Alisabri announced his resignation after having presented the International Monetary Fund's Article 4 report on Sri Lanka in Parliament. Writing to the President in his letter of resignation, Sabri stated that it was not his intention to take up any posts after he stepped down from his earlier portfolio on the 3rd of April. He added that he is of the view that fresh aforehand and unorthodox steps need to be taken including the appointment of a new finance minister in order to implement necessary steps to surmount the ongoing crisis faced by the country. The ex-finance minister also expressed his willingness to step down from his parliamentary seat and paved the way for a suitable candidate who is able to handle the situation outside parliament. Meanwhile, Secretary to, <coughs> sorry, ex Secretary to the Ministry of Finance, SR Articula, has resigned from his position. He has reportedly tendered his letter of resignation to the President today. Articula was appointed as the Secretary to the Tre Treasury Ministry of Finance, effective from the 19th of November 2019. Prior to being appointed to his post, he held the position of Deputy Governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka. He, he also held the position of Assistant Governor of the Central Bank and had been released to the Ministry of Finance to serve as the Deputy Secretary to the Treasury. The Finance Secretary's res resignation comes hours after the newly appointed Finance Minister Ali Sabri announced his de decision to step down as well. Meanwhile, the Governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka, Ajit Nivat Kabral, also resigned from his position yesterday. Former Deputy Governor of the Central Bank, Nandalal Virasinghe, is tipped to take over the post of Governor this week. Speaking to foreign media, Virasinghe confirmed that he has accepted the position offered. And meanwhile, the International Monetary Fund said today that it is monitoring political and economic developments in Sri Lanka very closely and is looking forward to working with Sri Lankan authorities. Following the resignation of former Central Bank Governor Ajit Nivad Kabra's resignation, former Deputy Governor Nandalal Virasinghe has been tipped to head the country's monetary authority. He will be expected to spearhead, pulling the South Asian nation out of an economics tailspin, avoid an ISB default and start aid talks with the International Monetary Fund. Virasinghe is expected to take over as the governor of the Central Bank on the 7th of April. Virasinghe has confirmed this to a foreign media outlet by phone from Australia. Meanwhile, the International Monetary Fund said today that it is monitoring political and economic developments in Sri Lanka very closely, as public unrest grows amid its worst economic crisis in decades. In a statement to international media, IMF Sri Lanka Mission Chief Masahiro Naozaki announced that IMF staff are looking forward to program discussions with the authorities, including during the visit of the country's finance minister to Washington later this month. In the meantime, the Monetary Policy Review No. 3 of 2022, which was scheduled to be announced today, was postponed, the Central Bank of Sri Lanka stated. In a statement, the CBSL said that the press release and the resulting media briefing scheduled for today have been postponed. The date for the announcement of the press release and the press conference will be informed in due course, the CBSL said further in its statement. With that, we'll be back with more news right after this short break.
Welcome back. As protests continue to happen across the country, State Minister Kanchana Vijay Sekara has called on the Speaker of the Parliament to order the Inspector General of Police to investigate and identify those behind attacks carried out on the residences of parliamentarians. The State Minister went on to say that the once peaceful protests have now taken a turn in the direction of violence and seem to be heading towards anarchy, adding that he suspects that they were carried out by organised individuals. For six continuous days, the people of Sri Lanka continued to take to the streets to express their strongest pleasure in the government and the current state of the economy. Protests were staged at various locations throughout Colombo, especially in front of the presidential secretariat last evening. And today was no different as members of the public continued to rally at multiple areas as well. Notably, with parliament convening today, police had taken measures to set up barricades blocking the entry towards the parliament. As expected, a group of protesters had converged at the location and commenced protesting. With that, the police then proceeded to set up barricades at another entrance to the parliament as well. Not long after, a group of people began protesting there as well. The protesters continued the agitation despite the rain and began inspecting the vehicles that began exiting the parliamentary premises. In the meantime, Archbishop of Colombo's eminence Malcolm Cardinal Ranjit along with other members of the Catholic clergy carried out a peaceful march in Borella today. We don't talk, no slogans. In other developments, last night a spate of protests had been carried out targeting the residences of many parliamentarians. However, what had started out as peaceful protests had escalated to the extent where some of the protesters had gone as far as to cause damage to some of the properties. The residences of a few parliamentarians that sustained damages were those of former ministers Roshan Ranasinghe, Gamini Lokuge, Kehelia Ramukwelda, and State Ministers Shehan Semasinghe and Channa Jayasumanam. Under this situation, the police had fired tear gas and used water cannons to disperse the groups. Meanwhile, speaking in Parliament today, State Minister Kanchana Vijay Singhan urged the Speaker of the Parliament to order the IGP to look into these attacks. ಉದ್ಘೋಷಣೆ in the meantime, the police issued a statement today stating that people are allowed to exercise their right of freedom of expression through peaceful protests, except those causing damages during protests will be brought to justice. The statement read that measures will be taken to identify individuals seen in video footage causing damages to public and private property. Similarly, the Bar Association of Sri Lanka also issued a statement requesting the public to express the dissent peacefully without targeting private property or causing destruction to property. They stated that such conduct is criminal and can lead to protesters being charged in courts of law. The association went on to say that if a peaceful protest becomes violent, such protests would only dilute the proper objective of the protest and will strengthen the hand of those who seek to suppress legitimate dissent. Meanwhile, the US ambassador to Sri Lanka, Julie Chung, taking to social media, urged the public to continue to carry out peaceful protests while encouraging the government to draw on the best minds in Sri Lanka to solve the economic crisis. Secretary to the Ministry of Defence, retired General Kamal Gunaratna, has called on the public to refrain from carrying out acts of violence and damaging public and private property. In addition, he has also urged protesters not to be deceived by those who incite violence for various motives. 
Secretary to the Ministry of Defence, retired General Kamal Gunaratna, has called on members of the public to refrain from carrying out acts of violence during the current spate of public protests being carried out across the country. He added that the defence establishment has witnessed two groups active in the protests, namely one group who conducts peaceful protests, while another deliberately engages in violent protests in an organised manner, causing damage to public and private property. The Defence Secretary also assured that the security forces will act to maintain peace at all times and have been placed in an awkward position because it is evident that the campaign has now gone beyond the framework of democracy due to its violent nature. He added, however, that the security forces will not hesitate to enforce the law against those involved in violence during the protests. He also urged protesters not to be deceived by those who incite violence for various motives. Now, given the current power and fuel shortage in the country, the Public Utilities Commission has called on the President to immediately appoint a Cabinet Minister in charge of power and energy with the suitable knowledge and the skills required for the position. Meanwhile, the Ceylon Electricity Board announced that the power cuts will be extended for 6 hours and 30 minutes in areas outside the main areas of Colombo. Under the Indian line of credit, another vessel carrying a consignment of 40,000 metric tons of diesel arrived in Colombo today. A vessel that had arrived in the country the day before is currently being unloaded at the Ceylon Petroleum Storage Terminal's Muthurajavela Terminal. Further, another shipment of fuel is expected to arrive in the country tomorrow. In the meantime, the Public Utilities Commission has called for the immediate appointment of a Cabinet Minister in charge of power and energy. The Minister of the PUCSL, Janaka Ratnaika, has sent a letter to the President requesting him to appoint a qualified person with knowledge and skills in the relevant fields. Meanwhile, due to the prevailing power crisis, power cuts will be imposed for 6 hours and 30 minutes daily from today until the 8th of this month in all other areas except the main areas in Colombo. Accordingly, power cuts will be imposed for zones A to F from 8 a.m. to 12 noon and 4 hours from 5 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. for 2 hours and 30 minutes. From G to L zones, the power will be cut off from 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. for 4 hours and again from 7.30 p.m. to 10 p.m. for 2 hours and 30 minutes. There will also be a 3-hour and 30-minute power cut in the Colombo priority area from today until the 8th of this month. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs has taken steps to temporarily close down the Sri Lankan embassies in Oslo and in Baghdad and the Sri Lankan Consulate General in Sydney. According to a statement issued by the Foreign Ministry, the move comes after the recent decision made by the Cabinet of Ministers. The statement added that with the decision to regard, with regard to the temporary closure of the missions as taken by the Sri Lankan government following careful consideration. Following the closure of the two resident missions, the ambassador of Sri Lanka in Stockholm, Sweden, will be concurrently accredited to Norway. Meanwhile, the ambassador of Sri Lanka in Abu Dhabi, the United Arab Emirates, will be concurrently accre accredited to Iraq. Further, the consular jurisdiction of the consular general in Sydney will thereby revert to the High Commission of Sri Lanka in Canberra, Australia. The Foreign Ministry states that it will undertake necessary measures to address all consular-related matters of Sri Lankan citizens residing in Norway and Iraq and within the consular jurisdiction of Sydney through the new accreditations. The new accreditations come into effect from the 30th of April. The Energy Sector Committee of the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce has been studying the ongoing energy crisis in the country and recently wrote to the Minister of Power and other relevant policymakers, emphasizing on nine key recommendations covering short-term and medium to long-term measures needed to ensure economic stability in the country. The Ceylon Chamber of Commerce has issued short, medium and long-term suggestions to the government in order to ensure economic stability in the country. The Chamber has called for an end to the moratorium on COVID-19-related payment deferments above a certain value so that those who can afford to pay electricity bills are opted out of the payment deferments. The CCC says that it is of the view that these measures will help mitigate the current financial crisis faced by the CB. It was for the suggested to update all payment dues from the CB to independent power producers that impacts their capacity to generate electricity and meet their bank loan payments. Further, the CCC states that any delays in debt repayments caused by the economic disadvantages should be exempted from the crib as it is beyond the control of the investor. The Chamber also called on the government to immediately revise the electricity tariff and ban structure and for it to clear net metering and net accounting application backlogs. Among the short-term measures, the Chamber wants a study on strategies to find a way of identifying how vulnerable groups such as small hotels and small shops, including SMEs, can be insulated from power cuts. The Chamber also emphasised that the renewable energy dispatches 
to remain connected to the grid at all times, especially during daytime power cuts. Among the medium to long term measures mentioned by the Chamber through its Energy Sector Committee, the key recommendations are as follows. Implementation of the power wheeling and peer-to-peer -peer power purchase agreements, which is a common methodology used worldwide. And the introduction of an efficient and transparent application and project approval methodology to annually increase renewable energy targets in the grid. Welcome back. While solutions are sought for Sri Lanka's economic crisis, economists and policy experts offered an explanation on how Sri Lanka should recover from the crisis. These views came during a recent webinar that was organized to discuss the solutions to the ongoing economic crisis in Sri Lanka. Looking at Sri Lanka today, we have negative net international foreign reserve position at the moment. If you want to go for a currency board, basically we have to have enough reserves to match the amount of currency that we have issued. We don't even have enough foreign reserves to pay our debt. The other one is that we'll have to give up our monetary policy. And the so one thing is if we cannot use our domestic monetary policy, we need to have our wages and prices need to be flexible downwards. So wages need to be able to adjust in order to be in line with inflation of whatever the country that we are aligning with the other one very often in this kind of crises which start as sovereign crises which very quickly go into a balance of paper crisis end up in a financial crisis in that situation are we willing to give up for the central bank to be able to do its job as the lender of last resort i think the sri lankan economy and sri lankan society has changed quite a bit and i think the idea that this could be a manufacturing powerhouse in order to produce export goods maybe that era might be over. And I say this partly because of the demographics. I mean, you've got an aging population that is hardly growing. So the, this is not the place to have an employment intensive manufactured industry like the way China did 20 years ago. What Sri Lanka does have is a, a possible comparative advantage in services and in particular in the higher end services. The fact that FDI didn't arrive is a sign that the potential investors have figured out that this is not going to be a place where you're going to get a big manufacturing export-led growth boom. It's the first time that we are getting into a debt restructure process with the IMF. The IMF funding will require that funding is not used to repay creditors. And the credibility of the IMF is necessary, but it comes alongside and parallel. It's not a sequencing thing. You, don't, you can't first have an IMF program and or you certainly can't afford to wait that long and then start the debt restructuring negotiation. You begin the negotiation and IMF has to be parallelly supporting the analysis and the credibility and offer. It's, it's a whole package you offer when IMF says, hey, I will give Sri Lanka so much if you guys take a haircut so much. So if IMF gives you enormous leverage with your creditors as they did in Argentina and elsewhere because the creditors know that if the IMF doesn't offer that money, then they might get nothing. And the IMF can make credit just take a much bigger haircut by saying, look, this is our view that you've got to take this haircut for us to give Sri Lanka this assistance. So it goes together. Now, ICT and startup companies have called on the government to scrap the emergency declaration immediately, citing difficulties among their members who find it hard to justify Sri Lanka's safety to their foreign stakeholders. In a media communique, the ICT and the startup community says that they are gravely concerned by the declaration of a state of emergency by President last Friday. They are of the view that the declaration of state of emergency is not a solution to the present social economic situation and that the right approach is in fact to open a dialogue between the political leadership and the country's constituents. They also say that their community finds it difficult to defend and justify its stakeholders that Sri Lanka is a safe environment to build innovative businesses, products and provide continued services at global standards in a backdrop where the country is affected from an economic crisis. Due to the ongoing crisis, many of the members have had to start looking outside of Sri Lanka for the continued delivery of their products and services. Further, they say that economic impact created by the current situation further compounds the challenges faced by our early-stage companies and will prevent necessary investment and risk capital to come into the country. With that being the case, they call on the government to repeal the state of emergency as this is causing more uncertainty amongst their stakeholders. The all share price index ended in the green today, gaining 493 points to end at 8,738. The SP SL20 of more liquid stocks, meanwhile, also gained by 187.44 points to close at 2,872 points. 
Overall market turnover at the end of the day's trading was 1.1 billion rupees. In the meantime, U.S. traders were back on sanctions and stagflation watch today as oil and inflation-sensitive bond yields soared and stock markets drooped ahead of an expected tightening of Western measures against Moscow. Europe's stock 600 index, meanwhile, saw modest gains fizzle out, while Wall Street's S&P 500 futures were 0.2% lower. Now, for the first time in Sri Lankan history, the Sri Lankan rupee depreciated past 300 rupees against the US dollar today. According to the central bank, the selling rate of the US dollar now stands at 303 rupees and 49 cents. The buying rate of the US dollar is listed at 293 rupees and 23 cents. Meanwhile, the selling rate of the US dollar as per the rupee according to the daily exchange rates of several licensed commercial banks in Sri Lanka have been recorded at 310 rupees. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Stay with us once again tomorrow. Good night.